tell people what you know. And uh, although I read a lot of books, I did uh, two faculties. I did the Faculty of Letters from the University of Bucharest and the Faculty of Journalism. But also, I'm a programmer and an entrepreneur. All the things I learned are learned by trial and error. All the things I learned are, have been learned by, by um, direct experience. So when Paul asked me, Dragos, come and tell something, I said, OK, I will tell five stories. Of course, these stories will have a meaning, or at least I think they will have a meaning. And uh, I will try to rely on you, on your feedback, to get the meaning of these stories. What's important about them is that they are entirely true. They're based on my own experience, they're part of my life, and uh, many of them are related to my experience as an entrepreneur. Now, what's an entrepreneur? Mm. Mm. Courageous. An independent one. No, I think it's a, it's a guy that comes with an idea and puts it into practice. Okay. Try to solve problems the world. Find problems and try to solve it. Like a mathematician or something like this. It's pretty close, pretty close. I like, I like the definitions, but we can try more. <coughs> What's the most important, I don't know, quality of an entrepreneur? Take the risk. Come again? Mm -hmm. It's somewhat easy. He believes in this idea. Yes, everybody Find believes in this idea, but few are, are actually doing something. <laughs> Find and build opportunities. Take the risk. Yes, exactly. For me, an entrepreneur is a person able to jump into an empty pool, hoping that water will be here by the time it needs. That's how risky it is to be an entrepreneur. Now, I'm going to tell you a few things about myself as an entrepreneur. I jumped into an empty pool 14 years ago, and hopefully I did enough stuff to have the pool filled with water by the time I need it. So the first story is about my first car as an entrepreneur. I had a car back in... Uh, <coughs> 98. That's my car. Everybody recognize the car? Yes. Uh, you know? Now, I, I need something like a, a technicality. It's a Nova or a Supernova? Supernova. Supernova. Super Super Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so, that was my car. I always thought that this car has something voodoo-ish around it. Yeah. At times, there was something overheating inside and there was white steam going from under the hood. Especially when I was at Crossroads. <coughs> And especially when there was a policeman there, and uh, I had to stop and pull over and wait for the for the heat to, to come down and then start. In time, I I grew up uh, I grew up a very very useful habit. I took every everywhere I go, I everywhere I went, I took on four liters of water with me. And every time I was uh, having these problems of, uh, of overheating, I was stopping, have a cigarette, and refill the, the tank. Uh, I, somehow I, I thought that all the policemen were knowing me already. One day, and that's the story, one day it was winter, I was at, um, at a red light. On the left there was a tram station, on the right it was a side. I was at a poly, he was on the right, and we were talking. We were coming from a client and we were telling stories, okay, how can you get this client, what should we do about this, this client? And as we talked, it was silent, winter afternoon, something happened. Boom! There was an explosion. I'm not kidding. I heard the ginormous sound and the car tramped and it exploded. I, at first I didn't know what it is. I looked on the left, everybody ran away. <laughs> everybody ran away. And my colleague was like this. <laughs> and the first thing I did, I, I stepped out of the car, I look around, they are shooting at us. <laughs> One, that's the first number of the thing that uh, I can tell about you. I've done the military service uh, during the Romanian Revolution in Timișoara. So I witnessed a lot of stuff and I still have a little bit of uh, <coughs> bad memories. And at first I said, okay, here it goes again. <laughs> <laughs> now, fortunately, nobody was shooting at but when I looked around, the rear, uh, the rear uh, windshield was gone. Absolutely gone. It, it was all around pieces of glass all over the place. And the first thing I did, I went into the trunk, I took a broom, Nicely took off all the pieces, put it in a plastic bag, put it in a trunk, get on and move on. <laughs> now, we are at the office and um, while we were still walking, I had all the, all, the, all the feeling of a ginormous atomic explosion in my head. What was the cause of this thing? What happened? What happened? 
And then we, we came at the office, took all the pieces and started a little bit of forensic analysis. And what we found out was the following thing. We, you know all the, the heating thing that you have in front of the rear, the windshield? Because of a malfunction, part of it was a little bit bigger, it got heat way too much, and the glass starting to over uh, uh, expand, and at some point it couldn't be contained and it exploded. I called a few guys that I know that they worked at the, at the factory and they say one in a million they didn't produce one in a million. <laughs> 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 one in a million situation like this can come. And um, that was the first story. And, um, if you were to get a meaning of, out of this story, what would you do? And, you know, I'm waiting for you. Don't buy super <laughs> Good point. Good point. Four liters of water don't help all the time. Okay, we're getting closer. We're getting closer. One more, please. Don't come push your luck. Come again? <laughs> good, good. It goes along with that whole thing that don't buy supernova, but uh, here's what I think. <laughs> For me, that did the trick. You know, as an entrepreneur, I often meet with explosions. Things for get out of control and control. And uh, I was very happy to be exposed to this type of situation as an, at an early stage because uh, every time I had an explosion like uh, employees flying away, like market going down, like clients flying away, like prices going up and down and whatever, the first thing I did was to first clean the scene and then find a pose. And it will happen. It will happen a lot, believe me. And this attitude of first getting your, yourself back into the shape and then finding a cause and trying to fix the things proved to be very helpful. So that was the first story. Now, we're moving on to my US visa story. <laughs> that is something very important. As I told you, in 2008, I sold my company. Part of the contract was the fact that I had a non-complete agreement. Everybody knows what a non-complete agreement is. So for two years, I, I wasn't able to work here in Romania or in a few countries where the buyer of my uh, company had the activities. So uh, I took two sabbatical years and I decided to travel a lot. I think there were already three or four months since um, I sold my company. And I saw that one of my personal development bloggers that I followed a lot since 2010, Steve Pavlina. Everybody read Steve Pavlina? Everybody heard of it? The guy is huge in the US and I think he's the biggest person on the global blogger in the world. I think his website, stevepavlina.com, has around 3 or 4 million uh, visitors this month, each month. So, it was 3 or 4 months since I sold my company. I saw Steve is going to have a, a first workshop. Where? In Vegas, because this is where Steve Pavlina used to work. I bought the tickets. I got an early bird discount and I was very happy. Okay, I, I spent $300 and I said, okay, I'm going to Steve Pavlina. That, that's huge. Then I looked over the internet and I bought the plane tickets and also booked the hotel. And it was two weeks and I thought I spent around $1,100. So in total I had spent $1,500. And then I was eagerly waiting for the day to, to go. And at some point somebody asked me, do you have a visa? No. <laughs> no. no. Do you need a visa? Yes, of course you do. How do you get a visa? You don't get a visa for years. It's very difficult. How do you know that? Because I tried many times. Oh my God. <laughs> what am I going to do? I have everything bought. And I said, let's go and make the, the file. I took all the file. I, I completed all the forms and I went to the embassy. At the embassy, the first signals were not very encouraging. There were huge lines. People are waiting. And out of five people, four were walking away very sad. And I said, that's not a good sign. And then they started to fingerprint me, and I said, okay, that's not good either. <laughs> and then I got into the line, and uh, people were asked, uh, what are you going to do in the U.S.? I'm going for studies. No, you don't. Reject. Oh, my God. <laughs> I was starting to, to feel very, very, very anxious. And at some point, I reached to the, to the place, to, the, to my little glass windows, and behind the window, there was a, uh, a clerk, a black guy, 50 years old, a older guy, 50 years old, a white hair like the Tom from the, the, the Uncle Tom Hut. Everybody? Yeah. And he was very meticulous browsing my application and at some point as he browsed my application, I saw his eyes slowly starting to grow. It's bigger and bigger and bigger. 
okay, what's happening? And at some point, the guy stopped and he started asking me, sir, where are you going? Going to US. No, 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 which city? Las Vegas. And what are you going to do in Las Vegas? And I said, uh, well, in Las Vegas I'm going to do personal development. <laughs> <laughs> of the situation <laughs> and all the sounds in the in the embassy went down and I started to, to hear a very low humming you know I like the sound when the nerve peak was coming it was the sound of my universe crashing down <laughs> because I realized there's a very big chance that I don't get my visa <laughs> at some point although I thought his eyes couldn't grow bigger they did <laughs> he made a sign and said come here and in a very low voice he asked me sir Precisely. How much personal development are you going to do? <laughs> In an instant, I answered, as much as I can, sir. As much as I can. <laughs> Boom, took the stamp, 10 years this. <laughs> that's a true story, by the way. And that's why I got my US visa. <laughs> now, if you have to take a, a meaning out of this, what it would be? Glad a little bit more creative. Interesting, interesting, very interesting. Be creative. Be honest. Adapt. Be honest. That's very good. That's close. One more. Adapt. Adapt. Very good. Very good. No, here's what I what I think it happened. Keep calm and have hope. You know, I think at, at that point, whatever I, I have done, something would have happened that will allow my visa to go through. And in my in my further travel, because I traveled a lot, I went two times around the world. I. I encountered a lot of situations when, uh, when I had to go from point A to point B and all the odds were against, something happened and I always had it coming to me. As long as I was pretty, pretty confident that, I, that I'm going to get it. So buying all the ticket in advance and trusting the fact that I'm going to do what I wanted to do proved to be a, a good thing. Now, are we okay so far? It's your story. Three to go. The little crocodile story. That's a very interesting one. As I told you, I started to travel a lot after I, I saw my company. One of the I opened a company in New Zealand, and Thailand is uh, somewhere in the in the middle. You get to stop there in Bangkok to switch planes, or in Hong Kong. And uh, I decided to travel to to Thailand to take two weeks off, and I started to visit um, all the touristic places in uh, on the Chao Phraya. Chao Phraya is the river that goes through through Bangkok, and there are a lot of temples, there are other very nice things to, to look at. One day I was going to visit the flower market, which is a huge, huge place filled with flowers, of course. And as I went down to the fire, I saw a guy, a local, looking down to the river and said, Look, 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 there's a little crocodile. <laughs> to, to, to the guy, where? There, there were no crocodiles in Chao Phraya, of course, there are crocodiles. <laughs> I said, where, where? I, I wanted to see a little clock on that. <laughs> and he said, look over here. And I said, where? And he said, it's gone. Hey, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm fine, how are you? Where are you from? I said, Romania. It's cold. That, by the way, all Thai people will say, if you come from Europe, that it's very cold. Because they have three seasons, hot, hotter, and hottest. <laughs> and I was in the hottest season. And, uh, as we talked about, he said, uh, what are you here? What are you doing? I'm visiting. What do you want to visit? I, I visit the Wata Room Temple, I visit uh, another thing, the flower market. And uh, at some point I said, I want to visit the, the floating market. I, I read something about a very nice place to visit while we're in Thailand, which is called the floating market. 40 square meters of channels and people having, um, doing um, all that commerce and stuff like that. It was something <coughs> really spectacular. Now they have malls, they don't use this as a way to, to ship food, but it's still something very interesting. I said, okay, I have floating market for you. Good. When you come back from the flat, from the flower market, come here and I'm gonna take you to the float, floating market. I said, okay, three hours later, I'm at the choir. Guy is there, asking for the money, a lot of money. And I said, okay, let's go. He calls a guy with a tuk-tuk, puts me in, and says something inside to the guy, and here I am. On a tuk-tuk in uh, Bangkok, not knowing one word of uh, you know Thai language, 
and this guy, at some point I feel a little bit uh, scared and I <laughs> I better take a picture of this guy. <laughs> if, somebody, if somebody finds me, somebody, something happens to me, I, I may have a proof. And he drives like 10 minutes and at some point he put me on the, on the desert fire on the shore of Chow Praia River. Nobody, nobody. It was something not huge. That fire was not huge, just, just a log, a, a yellowish log there. And he flies away. I'm all alone on the fire and I say, what the hell am I trying to do here? And um, after two minutes, the log moves and it turns out it's a lady. It was a lady that was asleep on the fire and in a, in a broken English she asked me, uh, you want to do a tour? I said, yes, I want to do a tour. He calls a long tail boat, which is a boat with a, with, in a very prolonged form. And I'm on that uh, on that boat, and we started to to cruise the Chow Prairie. Things were getting a little bit strange and stranger and stranger. I, I didn't see my floating market. What am I going to do? And at some point, the long tail boat turns to the left, and I'm out of the main channel of the Chow Prairie. <coughs> and what I saw, when I started to see what they started to to show me, looked like this. Hmm. And for like 30 minutes, I was um, looking at real life among the channels uh, of uh, Chow Praia, real life of Thai people that were living in, in, those, uh, in those places. After half an hour or so, he slowly puts the boat to the shore and we wait. And we wait. Two minutes, three minutes. And then, when I was ready to, to tell the guy, let's go from here, a nice boat with a lady approaches. The lady goes very close, that's the real picture, the lady goes real close and says, Floating Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and that, why, that's when I realized that I was con, <laughs> big time. And I bought a small elephant and I said, oh, that's not good. The long boat put me back, the tuk-tuk comes and uh, put me back away to the, to the first buyer, but I didn't find the, the initial guy. <laughs> and I was so angry that when I went to the hotel, I started searching the internet and I realized that my floating market was 200 kilometers away <laughs> in a city called Dal Mon Saedu. It wasn't even in Bangkok. And um, I called the reception, I booked a tour, and the next day I was on a bus and uh, I was getting to uh, the Dal Mon Saedu and actually visit the floating market. And this is how floating market looked like. Okay, so that's the third story. What do you think the meaning is? <laughs> it starts to get simpler and simpler. <laughs> oh my god, that, that was so good. <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> very, very good. Now, we're moving on to the fourth story. That was a story um, called the challenge story. Back to the place where I was selling my company, I started to blog. Incidentally, the main revenue for me right now is from my blog, uh, which is at tragosroll.com, and around the blog there is an uh, ecosystem of services, information products, keyboards, iPhone apps, and so on and so forth, and consulting services. I was starting to blog in English, and it was very challenging because, one, I didn't know English very good, and two, I had no other peer. I didn't know where to go, I didn't know, Paul said that I'm a very good networker. I know, <laughs> not. I, I didn't know anything. So I started to build relationship for, I think, nine months and a year. I started to interact with a lot of people. And in one year, I grew a little bit of a, of a network of friends. And one day, a friend of mine, uh, his name is uh, Luciano Pastrello, he's from Brazil. He has a very good site called lifewine.com. Provides a blog post, a huge blog post, a humongous blog post called how to solve any, how to tackle any issue with a list of 100. Basically, the, the blog post said, um, if you have a problem, you can solve anything, you can overcome any block by writing 100 ways of going over that. It looks so, so strange to me. But at the end of the blog post, as we already we were already friends, he said, I'm challenging you, Dragos, along with another guy, to write a blog post about 100 things that you want to do, that you want to write about the topic of your choice. It, it looks so daunting that I instantly fire up my email and said, are you crazy? I'm not going to do this. I don't know how to do this. But then I stopped and I said, what the hell? Let's try. Let's try to, to write a, a blog post about 100 ways of doing something. 
And I started to write, and in two weeks I came up with a blog post of around 6,000 words, which is huge for a blog post, called 100 Ways to Live a Better Life. 30 minutes after I published, it became quiet. Up to today, it's still visited by 300, 400 people each day, and it was visited by half a million people. It was a huge success, and it actually helped my blog business to, to take off. It was, it was extraordinary. One year later, in uh, 2010, another friend of mine, Stephen Aitchison, from Great Britain, actually he's a Scottish guy. Stephen Aitchison uh, came to me and said, Dragos, let's challenge each other to write as many books as we can in one month. Are you crazy? <laughs> Are you crazy? I never wrote an ebook in one month. Let's do it. Okay, let's do it. What the hell? And we started the challenge, and uh, at, during that month, it was February 2010, I guess, I wrote around 40,000 40, words, which is very a lot of, a lot of uh, material to write. And I came up with two books. One of them based on the initial post proposed by Luciano Pastra. Of course, the books went over, and uh, I self-published the books on Amazon, Kindle, iBookstore, on my blog, and so on and so forth. Last year, in December, I received a very strange email from South Korea. Her name was Julie So. And she said she's a publisher, and she's working with a uh, publishing house in Korea, and she's very interested in translating my two books based on the initial challenge of Luciano Pasuelo, and uh, if I agree. And the initial impulse was to delete the email, because I get a lot of emails like this, and more or less, these are Nigerian scams. Are you familiar with the term Nigerian scam? You know what it is? No? Nigerian scam is a very popular scam in which somebody is proposing something which can be very profitable for you, but in, in exchange, it asks for a very small amount of money, of money compared with what you could receive. So basically, you receive $1 million in inheritance, but you have to send me $200 for the paperwork, and you send, and then it never gets back. So I said, what the hell? I, I don't have anything to lose. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe the girl is, is for real. So I answered to the girl, and she actually proved to be a real person. And her business proved to be a real business, and her skills in English proved to be real good. So, in less than 10 weeks, she sent me a contract, and I had two ebooks translated in Korean and sold on the Korean market as ebooks. <laughs> Just a small parenthesis before we, we get to the meaning of this. Um, three or four months ago, she came back to me with an email and she said, um, those are ebooks, to be very honest. She said, I have two news for you. What news, Julie? She said, I have a very bad news and a very good news. The very bad news is that the company that used to publish your books is not longer in business. And in, attach in attachment was a uh, contract telling me that, stating that they are no longer in business. But the very good news is that I found another publishing house, bigger than that, who <laughs> wants to put your books in print. So basically, uh, as we speak, my, the first round of, my, of these books is in print. They actually will, will publish them. I think at the end of November they will be ready on the shelves in South Korea. So, what's the meaning of this? Okay, we're getting better. <laughs> I'm getting better, better. I like it. I like it. That's very, very good. Now, we're going to the next, which is the flying story. The flying story. I spent a lot of time in New Zealand because New Zealand is a beautiful country. Uh, if you don't know, New Zealand is made up of two islands, the Northern Island and the Southern Islands. And it's, uh, they lack imagination. You know? <laughs> In the Northern Island, there is the main city, Auckland, it's a little bit of uh, more business. The Southern Island is more like outdoor and um, laid back and something like that. A lot of sports are taking place in the Southern Islands. So I uh, once, last year, in February, I was there and I thinking, Let's fly from Oakland to Christchurch and do a little bit of paragliding. I never did paragliding in my life. Let's do some paragliding because Christchurch is renowned as being the city of um, outdoor sports and something like that. So I went there, I set up at a nice motel and I went to the um, tourist center and I booked my paragliding flight for the next day. And she said, be here at, the lady said, be here at 12 p.m. 
there would be a company called Nimbus Paragliding that had to drive you on for 30 minutes. I said, okay, I am there. I saw three beautiful vans align. None of them had Nimbus Paragliding on it. They all took over, 12, 5, 12, 10, 12, 15. And after that, behind those white vans, I saw a wreck. Of course, the wreck has Nimbus Paragliding. <laughs> I said, that's my ride. I go to the guy who was with me. His name is Stephen O'Shaughnessy. He's an Irish, and you'll see later on why I remember his, his name. And uh, I went up, uh, we had all the gears in the back of the van, and we started to, you know, chit chat, small talk, and something like that. But I, I learned that the guy was um, uh, also a web programmer in his spare time. And we got to the premises, those are the premises. This is where we had to took off because it was near the Atlantic Ocean, and we had a lot of thermal. I didn't know the term thermal. <coughs> thermal are um, little places where the land is, uh, is warmer and the air is lifting and that provides enough thrust for, for the paraglider, for the glider to, to lift up. So this is how you, you actually fly. The, this is how you actually do the paraglide. And we got there and for half an hour we did not. To still just sit like and look. And what are we doing here? Right? We wait for the thermals. Okay, we wait for the thermals. And another guy came in, and he was uh, much more younger than, than Steve. And he said, Steve, do you mind if I try? OK, do try and see if you catch a little bit of the thermal. And he's the guy. As you can see, it was pretty close to the, to the ground. And uh, Steve, at some point, said, OK, we'll have enough thermals. Let's prepare. At some point, I started to realize that I'm going to fly, sustained by something <laughs> thinner than half a millimeter. And as uh, Stephen was busy doing his stuff, uh, putting all the gear, that's Stephen, all of his ball, he's Stephen. I got close to Stephen and I asked him the question I was dying to ask from the very beginning. I said, okay, we're ready, but Stephen, please tell me, be honest with me. Is this thing dangerous? <laughs> Stephen put on his helmet, put on my helmet, and answered, well, flying is pretty safe. It's the crushing that made it dangerous. <laughs> Surprisingly enough, I was absolutely relieved when he said that. I said, okay, let's put the gear. And uh, in like two or three minutes, we were actually flying. That's a picture taken by myself where I was flying. Now, the moment when, you, when your feet are not longer touching the ground is amazing. And also, all the time you spend in the air is also amazing. And I, I barely had time to do more pictures, but I can tell you we had, I had the time of my life. I flew like half an hour, and I think we went out to 500 meters. And uh, we landed securely, we didn't crash. That was very good. And uh, I'm very interested to see what is the meaning of this story. What do you think is the meaning of this story? Don't be afraid to try. Come again? Don't be afraid to try. There. Can we try more? <laughs> it's, it's good, it's very good actually. You're never ready to... Yes, also. Almost, almost. <laughs> Never crush. Do whatever you can to not crush. As long as you fly, it's okay. And flying is not dangerous, crashing is. So, those were my stories for you. And just in case you forget what it is, the main line is just to keep calm and face the explosions at some point in your life, in your career, in your activity. Either you're a marketer or a salesperson, as Paul trying to segment to a little bit of segmentation here in the audience. Uh, always carry a broom to clean up. Be ready to clean up. Have hope. If you want to go from A to B, you'll get there. You'll get this. Believe me. Stay informed. Don't be hijacked by crocodiles. Crocodiles <laughs> are much more common than you think. Yes? It may be some, I don't know, some client that is very demanding and you don't know how demanding he is, and he looks very interesting, and he kind of lures you into something. Be very, very careful with those uh, crocodiles. Take on a challenge, and that means being other people's stories. Try to mingle. There's so much you can do by yourself. There's so much you can do as just one person. The moment you take up challenge, like I take from Luciano, from Steven, from Julia, something perhaps miraculously interesting will happen to you. And being here for me, it's a challenge. I took on the challenge from, from uh, Paul and I'm here, although I'm not prepared at all, and I will never beat, by the way. And uh, 
keep flying. Remember, it's the crushing that makes dangerous. Thank you. With the blog. The blog started in 2008 and um, it, it grew rather slowly in one year and a half. Right now it gets uh, around 100, 150 K unique users by month. There is an ecosystem of products built around it, which means uh, ebooks, iOS apps, consulting, and uh, uh, investor or advisor. I am basically uh, functioning as an investor for two companies right now, for two companies right now, both are based in Romania. And uh, it took me a lot of year to, a lot of time to actually build the habit of writing constantly. And that's one thing that, uh, in, my, in my experience, is fundamental for this type of business. It's a business of creating content. Um, it's much more to be said about this business, but uh, that's a pretty rough answer. If you want more details about how to get through those thousands of units. We can have, I, I, have, I actually have a workshop on this, which is two days long, <laughs> but I, I'm not upsetting anything here. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you something that proved to, to work for me, write timeless content. Content that is not tied to a certain date. 95% of bloggers, or 100% of bloggers in Romania, but 95% of the other bloggers, are writing things related to events. The event interest will, will fade away, and you will not get readers interested in what happened six months ago, in what happened ten months ago, ten years ago. Um, and that's because there is this confusion between blogging and journalism. Blogging is something else. You can create a type of content that will be readable ten years from now. And if you can create, you know, like a filter of questions that you ask to yourself every time you publish a blog post, and one of the questions is, this would be of interest ten years from now, then chances that your content will be indexed and uh, used and um, served by Google or other search engines to the potential reader will be very high. So basically, uh, I write very, very seldom right now. I, I write five articles per month, but in the first three years, I wrote three articles per week. I'm, ju I just crossed the one million words limit in my, in my workers. So. The first million is the most difficult. <laughs> <laughs> the first million words. Other questions? What, what was your business that you saw? In Romania, yes. uh, online publishing. Oh. Online publishing, the business was called Mirabilis Media. I had the biggest car portal in Romania, machine control, and the biggest recipes, culinary website, called Polina Control. Yeah, apart from that, sorry, apart from that, I had in total 25 projects, but only two of the 25 reached the top. There were leaders. Over there. If you have to go three ways of your life, what would be actually the three best ways? I don't know. I don't give advice. I can only tell stories and let other people be inspired. And that's exactly what I'm doing with my blog. Um, one of the things that one of the things that proved to be very beneficial to me was curiosity. Never be curious. Never be afraid to learn something. Expose yourself to as many new activities as you can. Since I sold my company, I started. I had consistent activities, and by consistent, I mean activities that I did constant for more than six months in the following years. I've been a forex trader for more than six months. I still am. I uh, started to run. I had my first official competition a week ago and I'm running for the marathon next Sunday. And uh, I also started to learn tango <laughs> for like nine months. And these are, may look like unrelated, but there is a common link to all of this. And one of these links would be, I'm very curious, and I want to learn a lot. And the other two, as a person, I think I'm very stubborn. So by stubborn, I mean, like you know, one time Einstein said, um, I'm not very good. I just stay more with problems. That's exactly what I try to do. I try not to quit when the odds are against. I try to stay there until I consume the experience to its entirety. And uh, stubbornness and curiosity, by the way, are the two fundamental qualities 
apart from risk taking that for me are indispensable to an entrepreneur. I cannot see an entrepreneur who's not curious and who's not stubborn. And the three is to ask good questions. <laughs> I think that that would be a very good way to improve your life. Thank you. Next. Okay. Uh, have you always been an entrepreneur? or you are Until born? the age of 30, it's a very good <coughs> question. Until the age of 30, I was doing what Serge Gainsbourg, everybody know who Serge Gainsbourg is? He's a French songwriter. Have you ever heard? Mm -hmm. Je t'aime moi non plus. Tout le monde connaît la chanson. Serge Gainsbourg, uh, I thought I was. <laughs> was a very bohemian character in, in France and at some point he said about himself and about his lifestyle smoke preserves and alcohol disinfects <laughs> as related to the fact that he was smoking a lot he was drinking a lot of alcohol until the age of 30 I was closely following his percent <laughs> and uh, that means I worked in media for seven years I worked at uh, pretty much all the radio stations in Bucharest and at the age of 30, I decided to start my company. So, no, I wasn't always an entrepreneur. Serial entrepreneur or parallel entrepreneur? Serial, for me. I mean, uh, I wait for a project to, to come to fruition, and then I can gather enough energy and enough momentum and enough trust to, to let the other move. But is any way to choose if it's better serial or parallel? I think it suits your lifestyle. For me, it's much more important to have a, a, a focus, a broader focus. But for now, for instance, my business right now is to be digital nomad, which in itself is actually split into many other small activities. But as a, I say, you know, general approach and answer, it would be better in my experience to wait until something is consumed at the end and then start something. Other questions? What's the next? Oh, yes, curiosity. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak out leaders in March. <laughs> Honestly, this is a very big challenge for me. I don't know why Paul thinks I'm very good, at it, but I don't know. I'm um, I'm joking or not? Because you're a leader in marketing. Okay. That's that's why you're talking. You really are a leader in marketing. Okay. I'm gonna talk about self branding, that leaders in marketing, and um, what's the next challenge right now? I don't know. I, I want to go to Korea and follow closely what's happened there with my books and maybe spend some time, some more time in Asia. I want to spend some time in Thailand and Cambodia, but that would be next. Next question. I think that's it. Thank you very much again.